Labdien, labdien, draugi un domu biedri. Hello, bonjour, moyen, dobri den. I heard so many languages amongst you today. It is very refreshing. Actually, just over this lunchtime, I had a good chat with uh, some of you about the different languages we all speak. And I would like to add, despite that, this event seems to convey the message that we're able to speak with one voice as well. And therefore, I'm very happy and moved to extend the warmest welcome to the family of European Greens uh, gathered here today in uh, Riga, the capital of Latvia, for your 35th council. Yay! <laughs> Special shout out also to our online viewers. Uh, we miss you dearly here as well, and happy you're joining us online. And it's very special to see that so many of you have made the journey and uh, traveled here, because this is such a long awaited and I would say also much needed opportunity to be together in person again. Imagine after two years of this pandemic and four online council sessions, more than 400 Greens from all over Europe are gathered here in beautiful Riga. I do hope that you actually have had the chance to get to know the city a little bit. Uh, let's say by joining the progressive uh, walking tour this morning or having a sneak peek at the green screen uh, yesterday um, at the film projection. But if you have not yet, don't worry, look out. There will be plenty of opportunities to get uh, out and about. But more importantly, I want to talk uh, to you about this council. This council, you know, is a timely chance to gather and focus ideas, to elect leadership and to welcome new members. I think that this conveys a, a message um, of the real feel and the potent dose of what it means to belong to the family of European Greens. It's a community, it's a family uh, which is strong and growing, which has a clear vision and also political clout for a progressive and sustainable future for all Europeans. If I mention Europeans, it's, I guess it's time to talk about myself as well. <laughs> um, my name is Elina Pinto. I'm a Latvian and a European, as perhaps my name also tells you. I am a policy professional and a civic activist and, well, today, turned into a stage diva or stage dread. I'm not sure yet which will it be. So bear with me for the coming two days as I will be the plenary host uh, today and uh, tomorrow. So if you see me coming up here, uh, listen in, uh, because this means something good, something good is about to come. Either some empowering keynote address or a very lively political uh, policy discussion uh, this might mean also that I'm about to announce news of side events to this plenary or about artistic performances or 
last but not least, that you have deserved um, a good break for coffee or refreshments. Important. And uh, if you need recommendations, uh, I already said to some that uh, the local honey cake is very good. <laughs> um, also, if you do not see me around, or if you're anyway more of a tech kind of a person, be sure that you have downloaded the Council app on your mobile devices. Why this app? Because uh, using it, you can get uh, information, nudges, tips about uh, the program, the speakers, venues, and about uh, the exhibitors present at this Council. But you can also find um, other participants. You can reach out to them, exchange your contacts, and even chat. This might be perhaps more useful for those that are viewing us online, but in case over the pandemic, just like me, you have grown a bit awkward and nervous around, around real people, do go ahead, use it here as well. <laughs> and um, this will be a few rich days. Uh, do remember to share your impressions, um, snapshots, uh, uh, ideas from this meeting also on social media. Uh, there's a special hashtag for this council, which you can see uh, on the screens right now. So hashtag EGP35. Uh, so I would say that with all of this, I think you are prepped for the real beginning of the council. And it is my honor to welcome on the stage for the official opening of the 35th Council of European Green Party, the co-chairs of European Greens, Evelyn Hüttebrug and Thomas Waits, as well as the co-chair of our Latvian friends and hosts, Progressivia, uh, so the co-chair Anton Nynasheva. Live Nilodzam. Let's welcome them to the stage with a round of applause. Thank you, thank you very much. And before officially opening the 35th uh, EGP Council, and also on behalf of the entire committee and all the staff, I would like first to pay tribute to someone who left us way too soon, Hugo de Armas. <laughs> Hugo, Hugo was not only a delegate for his party, Verdes Eco, but also the co-coordinator with Alexia Sakadakis from Cyprus, I know she's there, of the Mediterranean Network until the very end in December last year. He passed away in January this year at only 49 years old. Hugo was a smile and was never lacking energy. He never complained about his illness, which consumed him for a year. From the Canary Islands, where he's from, he biked all over Europe and was an amazing advocate for the European project. He was well known for fighting for alternative mobility and social justice, but he had also a contagious enthusiasm. He was always positive and had a great generosity. And I know that today he is organizing, where he is, a new bicicletada, wherever he is. So, ciao, Hugo, our friend. You will not be forgotten. And now, please, we would like to share one minute of silence together for Hugo.
Because what can be the alternative to the fossil fuels? How can we be energy efficient? How can we deal with energy poverty and a bigger socio-economic gap? Many of our green ministers in Europe have implemented ambitious plans to, fa to, to face the energy crisis. And you may have noticed that since the last in-person council in 2019, it was in temporary, the last time when we met, when we were also elected, we are now present in many governments in Europe, from Ireland, to Germany, from Finland to Luxembourg, as well as Austria, Belgium, Bulgaria, Scotland, North Macedonia, and of course, Montenegro, where URA was a government partner for the last two years before seeing their leader, Dritan Abazovic, becoming prime minister last April. And we are honored to have him with us in Riga today. Thank you very much. Our role as Federation of the Green Party in Europe, together with the Greens EFA group in the European Parliament, is to build bridges between our ministers across the EU, allowing them to get a permanent contact point. This is vital in order to have a strong, united Green voice during the European Councils. And moreover, the Greens are also strong at another level. And lately, we have witnessed strong victories the Greens have had at the local level, in the Netherlands, in the United Kingdom, also at the regional level in Germany. This is another reason why we are here in Riga this week, because our friends from Progressive are working hard within the local government. In Valencia, we have successfully organized our very first in-person event with around 300 local councillors and regional MPs from all around Europe to talk about resilient cities. That was a wonderful opportunity for Greens to exchange, to collaborate, to network and create common projects for the futures. Our motto of let's work together became really concrete during that weekend. The local level, and I'm also a local councillor in Brussels, is also the level in which to take more efficient action to fight climate change and environmental catastrophe. As summertime is approaching, we still have in mind the catastrophic events of last year, the floods in many parts of Europe, as well as heat waves and fuel fires, which ravished a lot of the arable soil and local biodiversity. We cannot separate pandemic, conflicts, and climate. All of these questions, these crises, and these challenges are interlinked. Together, they present a huge threat to our planet as well as to humankind and the animal and vegetal species. For the last 40 years, green parties have been calling to treat the climate as an emergency, raising awareness about these issues to political partners and citizens. We have been striving to act sustainably while governing and collaborating with civil society, with NGOs, experts, academics to shape a just and sustainable future. And finally, thank you to all of you for being here with us. Because more than ever, we need solidarity, mutual support, and common perspectives. We have no other choice than to work together and continue to strive for a better future on behalf of the people and the planet. Thank you very much. I knew that I forgot something, but I have to present and to give the floor to Antonina. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
So it looks like I'm quite serious on that picture. <laughs> Not that much in real life. <sighs> so I'm delighted to welcome you to Riga. I'm grateful to be able to welcome you here, finally in person, after several years of online meetings and phone calls. It's great to see you all once more together. Um, my first council experience uh, with the European Green family um, was three years ago, exactly the last one which happened in person in Tampere. A council that celebrated the victories and the growth of, uh, of the Green League, our Finnish colleagues, and the time, at that time, I was still fresh-faced, uh, a newly elected co-chair of the Progressive Political Party, and we took a trip to Tampere together with my colleague uh, Edmund. I think it is safe to say that we were uncertain and looking for inspiration, experience, and solidarity. And we found it, an abundance of it, among our Green family. For me personally, the most inspiring thing was to watch many young female leaders standing and presenting on behalf of Finnish government, city councils. You have to understand how thrilled I am to standing here and address you today from this stage. Much has changed since 2019. We all know that these years have been filled with unprecedented challenges. For Progressive political party, it has also been a time of unprecedented success. For one, we are able to welcome you in Riga as a candidate member of the Green family. And we are able to welcome you to our capital, a city that the voters of Riga have entrusted to Progressive. Since 2020, we are the core of the current city council. We are the faction of the mayor. We run the Committee on Environment and Housing, as well as the Committee of Social Welfare. So together, we have the opportunity to write Riga's story of a socially just green transition. And our story is the one where Riga has committed to the goals of climate neutrality and the Paris Agreement. We aim to be the first climate neutral city in the Baltic states and the one in the first Congress in Europe by 2030. We have introduced a unified standard of recycling and the recycling of organic waste. And just in one year, we increased the amount of uh, recycled waste to, by 25%. We have committed to supporting welfare by raising wages of social workers and teachers. We have provided new social services and improved, improved existing ones. Care workers for children with functional disabilities, daily care centers for senior citizens, housing for distressed families, social support workers for preschool children in need, to name but a few. Progressivi have reinvigorated the Riga Energy Agency, which supports transition towards green housing, energy efficiency, and energy independence. And as we know, never has energy independence been more meaningful for an independent Latvia in an independent democratic Europe. Russia's war in Ukraine is fueled by oil and gas export. It is a war that has awakened our democracy. It is a war that should wake us from the nightmare of unsustainable policies. Policies that threaten our democracy 
and planet. Putin's war has forced Europe to come together to move from strongly worded statements and deep concerns toward real and meaningful actions. The European Greens and Progressivi know the course of these actions. To fight against the crisis of this century, against both war and climate change. We need to move toward a sustainable, green and energy independent Europe to repair the cracks in the foundation of our social and health care services unraveled by the crisis of the pandemic. To put an emphasis on the Baltic states and the region around the Baltic Sea as a stronghold of security and climate neutrality. To work against those who would seek to subject our continent to corruption, authoritarianism, and violence. It is a tremendous undertaking, but it is an undertaking we are prepared to lead. In these uncertain times, international cooperation and strong allies are more important than ever. Therefore, we are glad to stand by your side, for we are united in values and goals. The goal of overcoming the crisis of climate change and the inflation of good and energy costs without sacrificing the welfare of those least protected. To stand in solidarity with the diverse people of Europe and to protect the rights of those most threatened. And for Latvia, to step away from the heavy legacy of the Soviet occupation and firmly say, our place is in a strong, safe and green Europe. On behalf of Progressivi, the city of Riga, and the nation of Latvia, thank you for your support and solidarity. I wish you all the successful council. Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you, Antonina. And first of all, chapeau to Evelyn, chapeau to Antonina. If anybody has doubts why we need strong women in the first row, then I think you're convinced. Now, latest. It's so great to see you all after two years. Two years, that two and a half years, actually, that seemed like a century to me. I mean, do we still recall? I mean, two and a half years ago, we were all like on the peak of climate movement on Fridays for Future. Like we, we managed together with civil society to bring climate uh, at the core of all political debates. All these questions around how can we find quick solutions? How can we make polluters pay? How can we produce sustainable food? This was what we were debating two and a half years ago. And we were, we were convinced that, well, this is the big threat of our time that we have to deal with, the main one. I think it still is, but then, you know, suddenly overnight we got COVID. And not just that COVID resulted for many of us in a lot of personal tra 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 tragedies. Many of us lost family members. Many of us were heavily affected. Our families, our friends were heavily affected. We were bound to our flats. We were in lockdowns. But more than that was concerning what we saw happened within our society. We saw a massive underspending in public health care.
We saw a massive lack of care for our elderly people. We saw that through neoliberal reforms, we were giving up core values of what keeps our society together. We saw poverty increase, or we saw poverty that was hidden before to become very obvious. We saw people that were not able to pay their bills anymore, that were not able to pay their flats anymore. Suddenly we realized we have a housing crisis. There's enough flats, but just they are not available for the market or they are not available for prices our citizens can still afford. Many of us have not been able to perform the job. So we saw that we actually, next to the climate crisis, very obviously have a big social crisis that we have to tackle. That more and more of our citizens are actually falling or going towards poverty, while the very, very, very few we're making skyrocketing profits. And even, you know, within the, the, the crisis, we have seen international and multinational companies having skyrocket wins while not really paying taxes. This is also an effect. We lost local, uh, uh, local shops, we lost local enterprises, and a lot of the business went to multinationals, which are not contributing or nearly not contributing to our social care systems. And then in the morning, when we woke up, first day, without a mask, we thought, okay, now let's, let's, let's pick it all up again. We woke up in the worst military aggression on European soil since Adolf Hitler's aggression against Poland in 1939, where a big militarized nuclear power invaded their neutral brother and sisters in their neighborhood, breaching international law, disrespecting all kinds of peace attempts, disrespect, disrespecting United Nations frameworks, disrespecting the peace order that we have built together after 45. And this puts us into a situation where we Greens never wanted to be in. Many of us come from peace movements. Many of us have a pacifistic ideal, at least I myself consider to still have a pacifistic ideal that in the moment is hard to match with reality. But I'm not going to go deeper into this issue because we're going to have a whole panel on this right after the opening uh, to debate what that means for Greens, what that means for our society, and what that means for our political decisions. So we have a multiple crisis. We have a security crisis, we have a climate crisis, we have a social crisis. And interestingly, all of those are somehow linked with fossil fuels. I mean, I don't need to explain to you how climate crisis is related to fossil fuels. I think we're beyond that stage. We all know what is going on. So we have to replace fossil fuels to save our climate. But now even people that have not supported our climate policies because they thought, okay, it's kind of a luxury problem and the Greens again, now realize, damn, it's not just climate. We have a real security issue here. We're dependent on fossil fuel imports. And yes, in the moment, we talk about Russia and authoritarian regime of Putin. Uh, uh, but I mean, where else is the oil coming from? I mean, all of these states are like most of them are not really uh, the ones that take care for human rights, that care for democracy. It's authoritarian regimes. It's absolute monarchies. It's dictatorships. That's where we get the fossil fuels from. So it's not just an issue on dependency on Russia, which is so hurtful now. So our security is heavily threatened by fossil fuels. And if we see what happens now in the moment uh, on the social side, what happens with skyrocketing energy prices, and why are they skyrocketing? Because the energy price is always built after the last uh, power station that is needed to fill the grid, which is gas stations. So just because the gas price is skyrocketing out of security crisis, we're having a social crisis where more and more of our citizens are not able to pay their energy bills anymore. Again, while companies, sometimes national, sometimes multinationals, make huge profits on that kind of game. We need to think about how we can make this money redirected to, to social needs that we have. So again, it's, social, it's social, a social crisis based on fossil fuels. So who has not understood now that we have to get beyond fossil fuels because of a lot of reasons, I don't know who hasn't understood it now, I think is, will never understand it ever. 
because it's so clear in the moment. And it's the green solutions that lie on the table, the green solutions that we all advocate for since many, many decades. Solutions of renewable energy, of energy democratization, of reducing of energy consumption by insulation, of investing into local infrastructures, into investing into local food production that keeps soil healthy, into investing into renewable energies, but also renewable sources of CO. I mean, products of forest and agriculture that replace oil, gas and coal also in our industrial processes when it comes to chemicals, when it comes to, to plastics and so on. This is the concept, and these concepts include a very strong social aspect. Solar power panels on house roofs, not using big landscapes, but making house owners energy producers that reduce their energy bills or even create them an income to redirect our funds in a way that it serves citizens first and create jobs because all of these installations, insulation, solar, whatever, need jobs here on the ground. And last but not least, we realize, meanwhile, how many billions of euros we're sending out of European Union and Europe for import of fossil fuels. We're knowing it now from Russia. We see, okay, it's, it's enormous amounts. It's hundreds of millions every week. If we all count it together, the whole importation, it's billions every week. And we realize that we're sending all this money outside of our economies. While we need to finance the climate transition, we need to finance security, and we need to finance our social equality programs. And for this, and if you needed the last reason, we need to re-establish our independence when it comes to energy production, also to keep the money within our system to be able to fund the transitions to all the crises we're in at the moment. So we're here at this council to share know-how, to share motivation, to celebrate the governments we're in, to celebrate the cities, the regions that we're co governing or co-governing, because these concepts that we're talking about is not theoretical concepts, but it's practice that we deliver on a daily basis. Many of you that are here now, many of the Greens that are out there now, we're showing how the solutions work, we're showing how progress works, and to get all of this disseminated between us, to share the know-how, to share the knowledge, this is what, why we have met again for this council, and also to encourage all of you that are not yet in the decision-making process. It's time to take over. It's time to deliver green solutions to our society. It's time to, to make the change for our continent and actually to lead the change for the whole world, for our citizens, for our next generations, and for our planet. Welcome to this 31st Council here in Riga. This Council is open. Wow, this was moving, this was pragmatic, this was resolute, this was a powerful kickoff of this 35th Council of European Greens in Riga. Thank you, Evelyn, thank you, Antonina, thank you, Thomas. And now for the opening keynote speech. As Evelyn already said, we have a true honor uh, of having with us a head of state from the family of Greens. So Dritan Abazovic, the Prime Minister of Montenegro, he's the leader of the United Reform Action Party, a candidate member of European Greens. And even before taking the Prime Minister's seat, the Montenegrin partners have been successfully leading on anti-corruption and on green policies. It is key to bringing political stability to the country and to strengthen its prospects for European future. So please, stage is yours. Let's welcome Dritan Abazovic, the Prime Minister of Montenegro. Thank you very much, dear Evelyn, dear Thomas, Antonin, Mar, dear friends. For me, it's a great pleasure to be here with you in Riga, and thank you very much for the for invitation. I will just try to briefly inform how one story, which was not believed for many people in the beginning, can become very successful. URA, the Green Party in Montenegro, is established in 2015. 
In that moment, nobody believes that the Green Party in Montenegro can have success. After that, nobody believes that the Greens can have some impact in the society which are not with same, no, with the same high level of democracy or with society which not have so big living standard. But nevertheless, we start to work very hard. Five years after that, we come to the situation to be in Tampere Council and talk with our Green friends and start our process to become in full membership of the Green family. With the high support of all these people which are here, Thomas, Evelyn, and all and others, which recognize that Montenegro, only country in the world, which is in constitution dedicated like ecological state, need to have possibility, need to have opportunity to have strong Green Party. In that 2020, we have election. First time in our history, after crashing of communism, after three decades, we changed the government in free election. URA was game changer in that period. URA in that moment make and explain to the people that democracy can be only in society which have possibility to change the government, to change the politician, and in that way to explain that nobody is untouchable. Our society after that is different. But that was just of the part of our, of our road. After that, we try to lead try to give our contribution in the government. In that period, personally, I was deputy prime minister, responsible for security. It was a lot of discussion that somebody who comes from the Green family, why is responsible for security? Because security is something what is today maybe mean topics, not only in the Europe, but in the world. And the new countries, in Western Balkan countries, when you have huge level of organized crime and corruption, you cannot discuss in, in the way to promote the rule of law without fighting of this kind of phenomena. So we are trying to give, to give our contribution to promote rule of law, to promote the new values, and we are very proud in result what we have one year and a half from 2020 until we start to make another, another success of Greens and make something which is really incredible. 30 days ago, Montenegro started to have, for the first time in history, first Green Prime Minister. After that, in the, in the concept of who is Prime Minister, that is not something which is important. Important thing is that nothing is impossible. This is the message of Greens. Nothing is impossible. If you truly believe, if you have the wish, if you're working hard, if you use, spend time and energy to promote really good things, in the, every, in the end of the day, everybody can succeed. Greens succeed in, in, in Montenegro. But this is not end of the story. This is just of the beginning of story. How URA was game changer in Montenegro after 30 years. European Greens, from my point of view, will be game changer everywhere in the Europe. This is only political group, only political philosophy which produce something new, which produce something what people didn't see before, which produce that we need more solidarity, more cosmopolitan spirit, and more solidarity in every aspect, more unity of the Europe. Greens are not only for the countries which are with a high level standard. Greens are for every country we want to see more democracy, more security everywhere in the Europe. Our region of Western Balkan. <laughs> our region in Western Balkan need that, need to be recognized like a part of the world which want to be changed. In now, and what, what Thomas say, this is crucially important for every society, especially for, for society which still have the problem with democratic standard. After aggression of Russia Federation to the Ukraine, 
nothing is the same. This is the moment that Europe all together, European Union and candidate countries need to find the common language to bring people together, to explain that we are not fighting not for Ukraine, we are fighting for the values, for human rights, for universal things and the way of living in freedom. People also in that region, like in every region in Europe, expect from political establishment to produce that kind of politics. Politics of dividing societies, of discrimination, of the attacking in human rights should be built in Europe, everywhere, in every country. Also, it's very important that people like in Montenegro, I think that in all other countries, which maybe still are not part of EU, want one single thing. They want rule of law. Why? Because they want justice. Justice is the true, and we need to promote more justice in our society. In that way, if we promote the justice, we will have possibility to just fight not only for things which are connected with the economy, but for the things which are connected with the environment and the protecting of our, of our planet. So, like the ecosystem, like the air, like everything which is connected with the environment, it's not only think an issue of one single country. Now, security, human rights, and another universal values, protecting universal values, are not just the issue of one single country. This is something what we combine and protect together. Greens, European Greens, doing that for many years in European Parliament, in the local Parliament, in Parliament of every state. I hope that also in Latvia we will have the same success like in Montenegro. I hope that in every country we will have the same success like in Montenegro. And I hope that the example of Montenegro will be will be provide everywhere so we ura small party explained that nothing is impossible we went and try promote that we are game changer in montenegro european greens have one single issue to promote that we are all together game changer in the europe and everywhere in the world i wish you a lot of success i I am very thankful for this opportunity, and you should know that in our country you will have trust partner, a trust friend for everything what I say here, to work together and to combine together everything what is negative and to promote different kinds of politics in the Europe in the next period. So stay strong, stay together, promote solidarity, unity, giving the hug to the people who really fight for the human rights. And I am more than sure that at the end of the day, everybody will be satisfied with the politics of Greens. Thank you very much for more time, and it was a great pleasure. Thank you. Go ahead. All. Many thanks for this forward-looking keynote speech. Drita Navazovic, the Prime Minister of Montenegro, the power of purpose and of partnership. This is the driving force for us all. It has been said, though, that one campaigns in poetry but governs in prose. And I was keen to hear your experience. And it is good to see from your example and also from that of other Greens in governing positions across Europe, that the Greens are actually the masters of both genres. So thank you, uh, Dritan. And um, we have gathered here in Riga now. And here we are less than 300 kilometers from the border with Russia. We are also about 25 kilometers from Adaji, which hosts the military base with NATO forward presence in the region. And it is therefore inevitable but also deliberate that we turn our attention to the question of security and defense. 
Europe is different. The shock of the attacks on 24th of February seemed to have stifled us a bit. But then Europe had come, has come together, and what we need as a, to change the rules of the game imposed on us by an aggressor, this is a clear common vision and clear common action by all political families, but also Greens, especially as we see more and more of them in governing positions. And therefore, the first plenary is dedicated to the topic of the future of security and defense policy in Europe, also in face of this new reality. And I now pass the stage to a skillful moderator, Thomas, the EGP co-chair, also a member of European Parliament, to moderate this debate. Please welcome Thomas back on the stage. Yes, thank you for this kind introduction. And indeed, I'm aware that this is not a comfortable topic, especially not for our screens. As I said earlier in my speech, we're all coming from peace movements, we're coming from non-proliferation, we were talking about reducing weapon exports for many, many years, and now we find ourselves in this situation. And I don't want to go even further in explaining what situation that is, because we were able to attract two speakers from the region themselves. And before we then all together will start to debate about what consequences that has for us, what the value base is on which we take our decisions, I want to hand over the floor to the people that are coming from the region to talk to us and to explain to us how they see what is going on and what their experiences are. And just after that, we will start with our panel discussion about what that means for Europe, what that means for us, and what consequences that has. So I would like to ask on stage first the, the chair, the party chair of our Ukrainian friends, the Ukrainian Greens, Vitaly Kononov, please come to the stage. He will speak in Ukrainian and we have translation. So please welcome Vitaly. Thanks so much for coming. I want to go to Montenegro. <laughs> <laughs> but my country has been at war for a hundred days today. I want you to hear how the Ukrainian language sounds. They are killing for him today. Дорогі друзі, я щиро вдячний за надане мені слово. Я разом з тим хочу передати вам теплу хвилю вдячності від українських зелених, вам, європейцям, за гостинність і турботу про наших жінок про наших дітей, які вимушено перетнули кордони своєї країни. Дякую вам. Thanks you so much. Dear friends, thank you for thank you all for giving me a chance to speak to you today. To all European Greens, to all Europeans, a big thanks from all Ukrainian Greens for help and shelter to our millions of women and children who had to flee from the Russian missiles and tanks. Сьогодні українські зелені на війні. Вони воюють. Вони могли б бути тут, але вони зараз на фронті. Є частина людей, які в окупації, є частина людей, які переїхали сюди і тут шукають гостинність. Але ми ніколи не чекали, що так може бути в сучасному світі. Um, today I'm here before you, but many Green Party members are fighting. They are there at war. Many are in the occupied territories. 
Thousands are dying, many more will die. Um, you saw the sorry. Те, що почалося майже зразу після розвалу Радянського Союзу, створення в 90-х роках Російської Федерації анклавів нестабільності на прикордонних територіях нових держав, Трансністрія, Абхазія, Південна Осетія – це не випадковість. Країна, що стала спадкоємцем імперії – зла, яка мала на своєму гербі планету Земля серпом і молотом, вона успадкувала і ідею світового панування. Так, саме так, не більше, ні менше, світового панування. What's going on in Ukraine now started many years ago. First was the blast of the buildings in Moscow, then war in Chechnya. Um, enclaves of instability were built in Nagorno-Karabakh, Abkhazia, Transnistria, and South Ossetia. Interventions in Syria and Ukraine, occupation of Crimea and part of Donbass, all this because one country, Russia, wants to dominate the world. Поки світ святкував кінець історії, переймався новими викликами збалансованого суспільства, Росія мріяла про реванш. Короткий період демократизації закінчився з приходом до влади в Росії КГБ, перейменованої на ФСБ. Не впевнений, але мені здається, що це вперше в світі, коли великою країною керує таємна поліція. What about the world? The world didn't notice and uh, celebrated the end of the Cold War. The world did not see the secret services of former KGB, today called FSB, grab the state power in Russia. Today, this mafia state Russia does business with Europe, buys politicians and influence. The world is on one side with Putin's Russia, that is on the other side. Чому ж Путін все-таки пішов на це? Пішов на такий серйозний крок. Що його спонукувало ризикувати? Багато причин сьогодні називаються коментаторами, але з нашої зеленої точки зору приволює одна – європейська ідея зеленого переходу. Відмова від викопних джерел в енергетиці. Це крах і смерть путінської бензоколонки. Це крах і смерть путінської Росії. Десятиліттями, удосконалюючи вплив і тиск на європейських керівників, застосовуючи підкуп, шантаж, погрози, підсадивши на газову голку енергетики Європи, він не може дозволити закрити свою бензоколонку. Тому фронт, який сьогодні приймають українці, військові, а вчорашні вчені, вчителі, айтішники, фермери – це не фронт війни Росії з Україною. Це червона лінія. Це виклик світового порядку. Це війна цивілізації. Why did Putin go for this war? Many reasons are mentioned, but we believe there is one explanation to it, which is the main one, which is um, the fossil-free um, fossil fuel free new green deal of Europe, the model of development that is a death sentence to Putin's model of chronic capitalism and fossil fuels based economy. He bought European politicians and worked with the European elite. Thus, Ukrainians, IT specialists, teachers, farmers, doctors and scientists have all gone to the front and are fighting now. They're fighting the war not only for Ukraine, they're fighting for Europe. This is the red line. If Ukraine loses, it will lead to the Third World War. Russia will not stop in Ukraine. This is our greatest challenge. Russia прекрасно розуміє свою військову неспроможність. Але вони відволікають увагу громадськості світовою блефом про могутність російської зброї, погрожують ядерним ударом. Насправді, вони відчайдушно намагаються перевести змагання з військового в економічне. Для чого? Для створення хаосу керованого. Про це говорить блокування українського зерна в Чорному морі. Це може призвести до серйозної ситуації в Африці, в Азії, до голодних бунтів мільйонів людей, 
протести і так добре відомо у вас в Європі міграцію. Темпи розвитку глобалізованого світу з його правами людини, боротьбою проти змін клімату, зеленою енергетикою не влаштовує Путіна і загрожує йому експоністським планам. Саме брак часу змусив Росію зробити цей крок. Ну, тоді перейдемо до на третє, да, давай. Що ти? Ви пропустили от це, і ми побачили з цим другим. Да. Um, про ядерне оружие, скажи. Yes, okay. I'm gonna translate slightly different because that part was not entirely in my text. <laughs> Uh, sorry. Um, yeah, Ukraine is a peaceful state, and uh, Ukraine has voluntarily given up the nuclear weapons. Um, but Kiev and Kharkiv battles showed Russia that they are not a superpower. They are trying to switch the balance from the military to the economic. They are now try trying to switch the discourse. Ukrainians know Russia better than anyone. With better weapons, Ukraine can easily win. Russia understands this, so it tries to use the economic and other methods of warfare. Blocking the Black Sea ports and stopping the grains from reaching Africa and Asia is a tactical move of Russia to cause hunger and famine throughout the world, to cause refugee influx and further instability in Europe. Не треба себе тішити думкою про неможливість уникнення загрози способом умиротворення врага чи збереження обличчя. Рубікон перейдено. Шляху назад нема. Колективний Путін, затиснутий куток обставинами, часом і глобальним розвитком, небезпечний, як ніколи. Тому у нас і виходу особливого нема. Ми мусимо в Україні з цим боротися. А як підтримають нас, ну так і буде. Ми у всякому разі вважаємо, що це наша важка доля і наша важка ноша. No. Um, collective Putin has pushed us to the limit, but we Ukrainians have to fight. We have to make sure that this war is won. Хорошо. Це не Путін стріляє в потилиці мирних жителів Бучі, Бородянки. Не Путін гвалтує дітей, жінок. Не Путін відправляє з Білорусі посилки з награбованим добром на батьківщину. Це робить русський зомбі-солдат впевнений в своєму праві робити злочини проти людяності, бо він вища істота, призвана нанести порядок в світі. Як це можна назвати? Побутовий нацизм. В Україні ми це явище називаємо расизм. Воно вже є в інтернеті. It's not Putin who is shooting like citizens in Bucha and Borodyanka. It's not Putin who is raping our kids and children on the occupied territories. It's not Putin who is sending from Belarus the um, shipments with everything they have stolen. Um, this, this is done by the Russian zombie soldier. Тому, давай звідси. Yeah, this is better from, <laughs> from here. So, we call it, uh, we call it Russism. You've probably heard it already from the internet. We call it Russian Nazism, the Russian fascism. Тому в нашій цивілізації немає іншого виходу. Мусимо перегти. Ми можемо перемогти заради життя. Therefore, this civilization, we, we don't have any other choice. We have to win for life. Мої зелені колеги, не всі громадяни поділяють наші погляди на розвиток світу. My green friends, not all citizens are sharing our views on how the world has to develop. Але всі громадяни мають знати про загрози, які виникають внаслідок відсторонення від викликів часу, особливо якщо вони йдуть з варварського минулого. But everybody has to know about those challenges um, that could um, appear as a result of us not taking those challenges um, upon, especially if they are coming from the side that is coming from the barbarian fight. І наше з вами зелене завдання донести цим несвідомим громадянам саме це. 
And our task is to explain to all those people who don't understand this that this is the way forward. А що до українців, то вони кладуть своє душу і тіло за нашу свободу і за незалежність своєї країни. Тому будьте впевнені, ми переможемо. Слава Україні! And the Ukrainians, they're currently giving their soul and body for the freedom and independence of their country. Slava Ukraini! Thank you. Thank you very much. Big, big, big thank you to Vitali and also to Tatiana that you made the effort to come all the way to Riga and to share with us to your direct impressions. Thank you so much. Next speaker is also coming from the region. It's Maria Kurina. Uh, she is a former diplomat. She was serving in several international institutions of the United Nations. And now she's a representative today of a civil society organization working on human rights violation. And she's in the organization Zmina, responsible for international advocacy. And I know that this is not going to be easy to chew, but I think we have to listen to what is actually going on on the ground so we have the context for our next discussion. So I would ask Maria to come on stage and to share with us her impressions. Ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor for me to be here and actually it is also literally a surprise for me to be able to stand on this stage. My name is Maria Kurina, I'm a civil activist, human rights activist, born and raised in Lugansk city. I'm an internally displaced person for eight years. When the war started, it started eight years ago, not 100 years ago, not 100 days ago. Um, why I said it is a surprise for me to be here? Because I literally could have stayed in Kiev when invasion started, full-scale invasion started, and my family was exposed literally to shelling and we had to lie down on the ground 27th of February, winter time. So for me, it is a great honor to be here and I'm here not to represent myself. I'm here to be vocal for all of those who are not able to be vocal, for all of those who are suppressed in the occupied territories, for all of those who defend Ukraine and defend democracy and Europe currently. And let me please also keep on uh, updating you on the development and on the current situation in Ukraine. I represent Human Rights Center Zmina, as Thomas mentioned. Zmina means change in Ukrainian. Uh, our organization has been documenting and protecting human rights in Crimea for eight years and promoting human rights related reforms in Ukraine for eight years. So unfortunately for us, it didn't come as a surprise, the escalation and the full scale invasion, because we have been warning international organizations and international community for eight years about gross human rights violations, about violations of international humanitarian law, about violation of international human rights law. But we, uh, as a civil society of Ukraine, are stronger than ever now.
from the second day of invasion, we established um, the coalition, which is called Ukraine 5 a.m., the time when uh, Russia invaded Ukraine, to document uh, human rights violations, alleged war crimes, and crimes against humanity with all the expertise we have been developing during these eight years to bring perpetrators and Russian high officials to justice and to sustain uh, justice uh, and relief for affected people, for suffered people in Ukraine. Um, and currently, more than 800 cases has already been documented. You probably all know the information from the news, so I'm not going to bore you with uh, numbers, but I will just tell some facts that need attention of European community. Uh, we are very concerned uh, that Russian Federation not only suppress uh, civil society in the occupied, temporarily newly occupied territories, it actually aims to wipe out the Ukrainian uh, civil society in the occupied territories by abducting, persecuting, threatening all activists, any possible uh, people who are vocal enough to say that those territories are Ukrainian sovereign territories, and those are just regular Ukrainians. Teachers, educators, journalists, media specialists, human rights activists, peaceful activists, local officials. Uh, we now have hundreds of cases uh, documented, uh, and unfortunately we know when we have access, there, there will be more, much more. We are very concerned about development of so-called filtration camps uh, in the occupied territories in the 21st century in Europe, uh, developed by Russia by forcing Ukrainians in the occupied territories, encircling them first and then forcing them to leave uh, those territories and literally they are forcibly deporting Ukrainians and forcing them to go through so-called filtration camps. I really cannot even <laughs> take it into my mind to pronounce it. Uh, we have uh, documented the fact that uh, Ukrainians are, uh, are going to ill treatment there. Uh, we know that some people were tortured. We know that those who arise suspicion for Russian military and other law enforcement were sent to detention centers in Crimea, and not only in Crimea. Uh, and just yesterday from local official, uh, we found out that there is a new filtration camp in Valnavaha, close to Mariupol, Donetsk region. Uh, we are also very, very con concerned and saddened about ill treatment of women disproportionately affected by the Russia's war in Ukraine. Uh, not only women activists and civilians, but also uh, those women who are defending Ukraine, and there are a lot of them. We know that political prisoners, women, are subject to sexual uh, violence as well. Um, I can continue more, but you can read all this in our rep reports or in the UN reports as well. I'm here to um, be a, a voice of those people who are now cannot defend themselves and cannot spread their messages here. I'm the voice of Yulia Payevska now, a Ukrainian paramedic leader who for eight years civilian paramedic who had for, for eight years has been training more than 1,000 civ civil paramedics and who saved more than 500 lives of civilians during the conflict in the eastern Ukraine. She is hostage of Russia's regime now. She has been abducted while helping to evacuate civilians, including children, uh, in, on uh, March 16th. 
and there is almost no information about her whereabouts. Russia, by uh, their propagandist tools, creating some kind of evil Nazi of civilian paramedic woman, strong enough to defend her values and to help those who are not able to provide medical help for themselves. Uh, I'm also a voice of Irina Danilovich, a citizen civic journalist from Crimea, uh, who has been uh, detained recently in May in Crimea. Uh, you know that in Crimea there is no journalism, no free journalism already for these eight years. All three journalists were either expelled or um, detained. Uh, so this phenomenon of citizen journalism occurred where people, just regular civilians, are coming and uh, uh, trying to convey the truth about the situation in Crimea during uh, the courts listening, during the peaceful protests of Crimean Tatars in Crimea and Ukrainian uh, civil activists in Crimea. Uh, for, uh, if I'm not mistaken, for 10 days we haven't known anything about her, just that she is enforced, disappeared. Uh, there were video on a local gas station that two men in civilian um, clothes ab abducted her. And only after we raised voice loudly on international level, Russia started the procedure and officially recorded that it detained Irina Danilovich. Irina Danilovich is a nurse. She's um, a civilian journalist and labor activist. She's just regular Ukrainian. But she also has um, this power to protect those who are abandoned there in Crimea. Uh, to assure my speech up, I would like to uh, challenge you a little bit. We are all now in a very safe uh, and nice atmosphere. And this is a privilege. You are all later are going to your homes, to your families, to hug your beloved ones, your children and your families. My colleague asked me, uh, where, is your, where are you located now? And I don't have the answer. For the second time, I'm displaced, and for the second time, I faced the threat of um, persecution if Kyiv or Lugansk uh, were defeated as a civil activist. So please bear in mind that this is now a privilege, and I believe that European Greens, as colleagues were saying that anything is impossible, can be true leaders and can show true leadership in the process, uh, not only regarding Ukraine, because as all of you probably already understood, this is not about Ukraine. This war is not about Ukraine. This war is a civilizational clash. So talking practical things, I will suggest uh, European leaders and the European community to keep pace on legal track regarding special tribunal on the crime of aggression. This is good that um, resolutions are already in place, but the leadership should be taken for the tribunal to be prompted and to be effective and the mechanism to be established. I also need to spread the word of my colleagues from anti-corruption civil society, which was really strong enough for all these eight years. EU candidacy for Ukraine is not a gift for Ukrainian civil society, for Ukrainian uh, military elite, for Ukrainian regular civilians. EU candidacy for Ukraine is the deserved uh, achievement is, deser is deserved because we, as a civil society, were pushing reforms in every sphere, in human rights, in freedom of speech, in anti-corruption for all these eight years, no matter that we had neighbor uh, aggressor and we had a lot of challenges. We are not uh, naive and we, are we do understand that uh, it's a quite enough work, homework for Ukraine to be done 
to gain membership, and we do not ask for membership tomorrow. But EU candidacy is a deserved achievement for Ukraine and its uh, reforms. So, um, thank you for listening to me, thank you for your attention, and please bear in mind that this is our mutual, mutual fight, and I do believe that Europe can show true leadership in the dark times for peace, democracy, and human rights prevail on the continent. Thank you so much, Maria. Uh, please take a seat and join our conversation. Uh, and yes, we are running a bit late, but uh, there was no way to interrupt uh, either or of these two speeches. So please excuse if we are running a bit late. So we ha for this panel now, I would like to introduce our uh, attendees, our panelists. Uh, and let me start with the online one. Um, it's uh, Andrea Marksteiner. She unfortunately uh, has uh, been affected by COVID. It's still there, unfortunately, but she will still join us uh, online. It's Andrea Marksteiner. She is from CIPRI, the Peace Institute, uh, uh, as I guess most of you know, uh, and she will uh, con give us a contribution on questions of peace and uh, peace and military equipment, weapons, and stuff like that in just a moment. So I would ask you, please take a seat. No, please take the screen and stay with us. Uh, for, for your interventions also. Then we have Andris Sprout. Uh, where, where are you? Yes, please come on stage. Um, Andris uh, um, is uh, the chair of, of the board of the Institute of International Affairs here in Latvia. And as I got to know, also an advisor to Progressive, as far as I know. Uh, at least uh, that's what I, the rumors told me in the room. But here today, clearly as uh, an academic, a very recognized academic in the field of international security security and international development. Thank you very much for coming. And uh, 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 yes, uh, welcome on stage. And last but surely not least, uh, my uh, respected and beloved colleague, uh, Hanna Neumann, uh, member of the European Parliament, member of German Greens, uh, member of the Security and Defense uh, Committee as well, uh, and uh, to many of you known as a strong voice for a feminist foreign policy. Uh, thanks for joining the conversation and welcome here on stage. And uh, let me first ask Andris to take the floor. You can stay seated, you can uh, uh, choose however you would like to, to give us a first input uh, uh, on, on your perspective on what is that actually doing with our EU foreign and security policy? What, what impact does that situation have? Uh, how do you see the EU reaction on that? The unity or not so unity as we've seen in the last few days? And what impact that situation, that aggression uh, and that bridge of international law has on the global security frame? Uh, and after your input, we will have a short exchange on that question. Please, the floor is yours. Okay, Thomas, thank you so much. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, it's also a privilege to be today at the European Greens Council. And as a Latvian, as a progressive, I'm delighted to welcome everyone to, to Riga. And I think this is really a sign of, a very symbolic sign of solidarity to be in those challenging days, challenging times, uh, here in, in the Baltic, uh, in the Baltic next to the Baltic Sea in the Baltic nation in Riga. So certainly I think this also shows the solidarity within a family of Greens and Europeans. Uh, as, uh, as my Ukrainian colleagues expressed, uh, these are uh, challenging days, challenging years for eight years of uh, war, uh, for 100 days of uh, full-fledged invasion of Russia into Ukraine. And this is not only about the tragic days, uh, but it's also about bravery, about courage, about resilience of Ukrainian people, Ukrainian nation. I think this really also shows how important it is to be uh, united, uh, to be resilient, uh, to be 
thinking that actually we are fighting for a uh, very righteous cause uh, in the war. Uh, as for um, Europeans, certainly you might say this is a 9-11 in many ways. Uh, this is really shock, geopolitical one, emotional one, political one. I think it transforms Europe. Europe will never be as it was before. I think it's especially 9-11, as some would even say, end of post-historical nirvana for the Baltic nations. We thought that we can live in sort of post-history, that pretty much the, we are safe. Uh, it appears it's not. The ghosts of the past, the history is many ways back. But it's not just about ghosts of the past for the Baltic nation or for Europeans. It's also how we address the challenges which actually undermine a global system of norms and rules and rules-based order. Uh, it, is, uh, it is about basically 21st century fighting against 19th century, when one aggressive power can just decide that it can invade the independent, uh, free, freedom-loving, democratic nation just because it wants to have its own ambitions uh, with, with, with regard to specific nation, with regard to Europe, and with regard to some kind of uh, zones or spheres of influence. So that's why it is, of course, the tragic and at the same time they demonstrate the signs of bravery for Ukrainians. It is shock for all of us and actually it was said already Ukrainians are fighting for independence and freedom of all of us, of Europeans. But certainly it has a wider global implications, repercussions as well. What about Europe? Uh, as it has been analyzed that uh, Europe has acted. Uh, ten years ago, a number of shocks, number of challenges, number of crises. Ten years ago, we uh, reacted in a context of financial crisis. It took several years. It took a few years to react. In a pandemic, it took several months to react. Now, actually, it took several days to react. We reacted quickly. We reacted quickly supporting Ukraine. Uh, with financial resources, with diplomatic political support, with uh, also the military support. Uh, we reacted quite quickly to deal and to address uh, Russia's behavior and Russia's aggressiveness, uh, namely the imposing sanctions, and we see the sixth round of sanctions just being imposed today. So this is important. Of course, uh, we, I think, re considered our own policies, what, who we are, that we must be more active. The strategic compass, which has been just adopted as well, and there have been discussions within European Parliament, but beyond as well. I think it shows that there is realization. We live in different world, in a geopolitical world, which is sort of creating new challenges, new tasks, new uh, issues and priorities to address as well. Um, of course, there is still a lot to do. Let's be realistic as well on this one. We are united, but there is diversity within this unity of attitudes and unity of approach. In unity is that, yes, Ukraine must win. The aggression must be stopped because it undermines the whole European system unless we do it. At the same time, of course, there is a diversity, and that's why more things could be done with regard of support to Ukraine. It was mentioned here, they, if not immediately the membership of the EU, certainly the candidate status is a political decision, which is important decision, which is important gesture. Uh, as well, of course, uh, we have, the Europeans have granted uh, around 10 billion uh, euros, but at the same time, to reconstruct the Ukraine, to make Ukraine a success story as well after the aggression, after the repel aggression together. Uh, certainly there should be something similar to the Marshall Plan. So there must be much more sort of the visionary approach as well, and not only in terms of money, but in terms of what we want to have in a neighborhood and how we want also to Ukraine to succeed. And uh, of course also in terms of the Russia, uh, sanctions, yes, but as the end, it comes back to the green agenda. It's cutting off authoritarian systems. It's basically about getting rid of fossil fuels. It's starting to think about own energy independence, about renewable future, about climate, environmentally friendly approaches. Basically, this also makes us not only sustainable, but more secure as well at the same time. 
And last but not least, uh, it's about Europe. As such, I would say we must be or we should become more smart power. We've been soft power, soft, soft power in terms of positive way. I mean, projecting our values, our norms, but not being too much of the hard one. And it's not hard only in military terms. It's also hard in terms exactly being economically powerful, realizing that with regard to Russia, our economy is five times bigger. It's much more efficient. We are advantageous position if we want to fully employ it. So that's why it's both soft and hard power to unite it in a smart power way. It means that we need vision. It means that we need political will. And I think and I believe that Greens also have this vision and political will to contribute to more united visionary Europe who is able to deal in this challenging world these days. Thank you. Thank you, Andres. Um, thank you very much. Yes, please. Is there a wish to intervene from your side uh, or from, uh, if I turn, I, I don't see her on the monitor, actually. Can you uh, make a miracle and bring us, Andrea, back on the monitor, please? That would be great. Yes, here she is. Is there a wish to intervene? Uh, yes, please, uh, Hannah. Yes, Tom, I would like to share a bit from the perspective of someone who comes from Germany. Um, but sits in the European Parliament. And I have to admit, especially, especially the very first reaction, so after the, in, the start of the invasion on February 24, I think we were all a bit surprised how united and how strong the European Union was standing when it came to the first wave of sanctions, when it also came across the European Parliament, but in the many different member states, about debates, for example, about arms delivery, but then very strong majorities in this regard, also carried by us Greens in most member states. This has carried us for a bit, but now, about 100 days after the invasion, we start seeing cracks. And this is a bit the dangerous moment, um, because as much as I would want, and I guess all of us want this European Union to stand united, we see clearly the Eastern European, the Baltic countries, where the aggression is quite close. Mm -hmm. It's just 300 kilometers away where also the aggression is quite close historically because they have suffered from Russian or Soviet Union suppression until 20, 30 years ago. And Western European countries where it's not so close, they have more pivot um, also towards what happens on, on the African continent, for example. And we have the social challenges. And to keep that together now will be, um, I guess, a key task for all of us, but I especially see us as Greens um, at the core of holding this together because, exactly because of the values that we politically promote. Thank you, Hanna. Um, if there's no other direct intervention, I would hand over to Andrea Marksteiner because I, I think it fits very well here. And the question, what about the right to self-defend? And how is this related with uh, a certain duty to support a country to defend itself against an aggression? And, and what, what, how do we still um, envision peace policy in such circumstances? As CIPRI is the main voice uh, on, on peace politics, maybe please give us your contribution, Andrea, please. Thank you so much, Thomas, and um, thank you for the invitation. I'm thrilled to be here, albeit virtually due to pandemic-related circumstances. I suppose this shows the pandemic isn't fully over. Um, if I may, Thomas, if it's all right with you, I would just like to react very quickly to what uh, Andre said, um, and then I'll, I'll go and, and, and answer your questions. Sure. Um, I think that Andres was, in, was, was very correct in saying that this is kind of a 9-11 moment. I mean, in this case, it means that there is a before the 24th of February and there is an after. Um, that is just how momentous this, this development is um, in shaping the European peace and security architecture right now. Um, I think it, it's also very fair to say that the EU itself is positioning um, is positioning itself as a full-fledged security policy actor, more so than it ever has in the past. You know, we, we see a total of almost 2 billion uh, euros provided in military assistance to Ukraine. Uh, this is the first time that weapon deliveries to a third party outside of the union is financed uh, through a joint EU fund. Um, just in Denmark, just a couple of days ago, Denmark voted to, to uh, do away with the defense opt-out policy that it had for European uh, defense. 
Um, more and more people are talking about EU, the, the EU's mutual defense clause, just uh, similar to, to NATO's Article 5. So I think, you know, the, the new rule, the, 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 the new role that Europe is taking on in security matters, it's really becoming apparent. This is a trend we've observed for, for some time, um, but since the invasion of Ukraine, really, it has, it has definitely bolstered the EU's role um, when it comes to this. So, so that's just uh, what I very quickly wanted to say on, um, on what Andre said. Um, now, to your, to your question on the right to self-defense, let me just start by pointing out um, that the right of states to defend themselves against any form of armed attack is anchored in Article 51 of the UN Charter. So that is um, a core principle of, of international law. Um, and, and in this case, I think we can all agree, you know, Russia unequivocally violated the territorial integrity of Ukraine. It violated Ukraine's national sovereignty um, by launching an unprovoked uh, invasion. So that means uh, Ukraine most certainly has the right to defend itself. Um, and, you know, that's, that's actually a, a rare case in which matters of international relations are this black and white, um, where there's a, quite a clear answer to that. Um, and I would also say that as sort of the first line of defense against Russian aggression, it certainly makes sense why the European Union and its member states are pledging support for Ukraine. Um, you know, and I, I, I guess the question that we're all kind of grappling with is how does, how does that reality, uh, how can we align that with the core principles of uh, you know, the pursuit of peace, the role of diplomacy, conflict prevention, things that have always been at the core um, of, of CIPRI's value framework, but also the value framework of the Greens. Um, I think that, that just because the EU and member states are providing military aid, be it in the form of funds or be it in the form of, of weapons, it doesn't mean that these core principles don't matter anymore. You know, I think as a rule of thumb, when we are confronted with any, with any conflict, be it anywhere in the world, our first instinct should be to protect civilians, to, to reach a negotiated peace that is as inclusive as possible. That, that doesn't stop being true. But at the same time, I think we need to be careful not to deprive Ukraine of its own agency in this matter. You know, over the past couple, couple months, it's, it's happened too often that, that commentators outside of Ukraine fall into the trap of saying, you know, Ukraine, you have to do this, or Ukraine, you have to do that. Um, as an example, some say uh, Ukraine should trade away territory for peace. Others say that Ukraine should fight until the bitter end. And it's simply not up to us. Uh, I, think, I think that's a really important realization to make. It is up, it is the decision of the government of Ukraine and the people of Ukraine. And the role that the European Union plays in this is the role of support and not, it's, it's not its role to dictate anything. Um, and, and just to kind of round this off, I just want to say a couple of words about, uh, about the disarmament agenda. I think that's another thing that CIPRI and the Greens have in common. Um, it's, it's one of the, the core principles that we believe in. And kind of reconciling this with the new reality is, is something that we've had to grapple with very intensively um, at the Institute during these past few months. Um, you know, how, how can we reconcile the belief in the disarmament agenda with the conviction that we cannot leave Ukraine alone in its fight against, uh, against Russian aggression. I would say, um, broadly speaking, the disarmament agenda is still very much relevant. I think most people, not only in this room, but most people across the political spectrum would agree with me that, um, you know, the less weapons, the better. It decreases the risk of diversion, meaning that, you know, that the risk of weapons falling into the wrong hands is decreased. It limits the damage done by, um, by miscalculation. It can reduce the incentive to go to war. Um, in the long term, it, it definitely has many benefits for peace. That said, you know, we find ourselves in an emergency situation. The world is, is really messy and there aren't always easy answers. Um, and, and like I said before, Russia unequivocally violated international law and Ukraine has the right to defend itself. And, you know, European member states also have a responsibility to their people um, to, to provide security from, from foreign aggression. We don't know whether this, uh, whether this war will be limited to, to Ukraine. Um, there are signs that it might not. So uh, there is definitely an argument to be made for why these measures are currently being implemented now. But I don't think that, that 
that means that we shouldn't pursue the goal of disarmament in the long term, particularly as weapon systems become more advanced, they become more proliferated. Uh, I think I think the conclusion that we can draw is exceptions prove the rule, right? Be it when it comes to the value of, of a restrictive arms export policy or when it comes to the value of the disarmament agenda. Um, it's, it's much too important of an undertaking to, to just, you know, toss out the window now. Um, but we do have to realize that, you know, things changed on the 24th of February and we owe it to the Ukrainian people to stand by their side. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, thank you for your intervention. <laughs> do you want to comment on what we just heard? Do you have a wish to add something? Please, Andres. Just a, a few uh, comments. Uh, I absolutely agree with Alexandra, with, with the overview and a way to go as well. Uh, I would underline two points. Uh, one is I would a bit re-paraphrase even the question about respect of for self-defense. I would even say that we should actively defend the principle of self-defense because at the very end it is once more again about the international system, it's about us. So uh, how we defend it very much on this depends the future of uh, the Euro-Atlantic community, of the like-minded community of democracies. And second one, um, second one, I would absolutely agree with the point that even though this issue is beyond Ukraine. It is about Ukraine, but at the same time, it has wider implications, the formative implications. Still, we should not forget the principle of nothing about Ukraine without Ukrainians and Ukraine. So certainly, this should be kept in mind. So one we in, once we engage even a goodwill with Mr. Putin, we should keep in mind that, first of all, we should act on behalf of Ukrainians and consult with Ukrainians. So this principle should be kept certainly as a, one of the guiding principles in, 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 in our negotiations or in our approach. Thank you. Thank you, Andres. Um, yes, please. Just a short remark that I'm really grateful you acknowledge that um, it is Ukrainian responsibility and um, story to defend ourselves and to decide for ourselves and for ourselves, the right of self-defense is about existential, uh, existential question. We do not have any right, <laughs> as we discussed before. Uh, the majority of Ukrainians are peaceful civilian people, and historically, Ukraine have never had any ambitions to invade any country and had never had this in our history. But we do not have choice. We have to defend our values, our democracy, our future. And that is why we are doing so. Thank you, Maria. Yes, indeed. Um, during a session in the European Parliament, three days after the war started, uh, we had the debate about using peace facility money for weapon supports for Ukraine. And you can see already in this formulation the potential of a contradiction within. Mm. And then the, a general, which is usually not the ones I listen all too much to, uh, the general made a very interesting comment. He said, look, colleagues, it's not our decision here whether Ukrainians defend their country or not. They have decided to furiously defend their country without consulting us. They took their decision and they're doing it today with bicycles, with rocks and with self-constructed Molotov cocktails. The question is not whether they will defend their country or not. The question that we have to answer here is just do we give them an equipment so they have a chance. And Wherever you position yourself, at least the guy had a valid point, which is exactly this reflection on respecting the, the decision of Ukrainians to use their right on self-defense and to see how we can help out with that. And then I would like to give back to you, uh, Maria. I mean, wh what is your, your perspective? What is your experience? What, what makes Ukrainians so furiously defend their country? What are Ukrainians fighting for? This is an easy question for me. Ukrainians are fighting for their freedom, for their right to exist as a sovereign country, for their possibility to choose their own future. And this is historically already set in our history. We have put too much effort, we have put too much uh, lives uh, in order to go back to European family uh, no matter we have been suppressed for 
hundreds of years, not only by Soviet Union, but back to the Russian Empire. And my generation and my parents' generation spent all their time and effort to bring democracy to Ukraine, to protect human rights, and to uh, provide people with just a regular possibility to live in their own country, to choose their own st way, and to go back to European family in order to unite uh, and uh, be possible to reform more and to, to develop in, in our track. Thank you, Maria. I think this was a very clear statement. Uh, is there any need to add something to this? I don't see Andrea now, but I w can you please put Andrea back on the screen? Because if there's no need to comment, I mean, this was a very clear message. Andrea, uh, I, what the whole situation that we see here leads to massive increase of military spending. And this in a situation where all EU states together are already the second biggest military spender of the world while I do not see that we see much of security resulting from that, but you're the expert on that. This is the field you're, you're contributing most of your work on. Tell us your perspective on where are we uh, with, with EU military and does additional money really solve the problem? Good question. <laughs> I, think, um, I think it's important to, to point out from the beginning that this is by no means a new trend. Um, we have been observing a rise not only in global military expenditure, but also uh, in European military expenditure for quite some time. Um, we see it with the United States, we see it with China, Russia, India, uh, Germany, UK, France, uh, just to name a few. But now certainly with the invasion of Ukraine, uh, we expect this trend to accelerate and also to broaden. Um, our, our most recent data shows that in 2021, global military spending stood at 2.1 trillion US dollars. Uh, and now with all of these new pledges being made, uh, we expect that to increase dramatically. As of, as of right now, I would say around half of all European member states have announced some sort of increase in military spending since the invasion. Um, I, I guess the most prominent example would be Germany uh, with its special fund of 100 billion euros to uh, finance military procurement. Um, Poland wants to increase spending to 3% of GDP. Uh, even Sweden wants to increase uh, spending to 2% of GDP. Uh, and there are, there are many, many more examples than that. Um, and while we can't be entirely sure of the details because they're just beginning to emerge, um, it looks as though most of these extra funds will be spent on, on equipment. So uh, buying new weapon systems and replacing old ones. Of course, you know, there's this whole dynamic of, of this benefiting the arms industry. Um, revenues in this sector are, are obviously ser uh, very closely tied to, to government spending on, um, on procurement. You just have to look at the stock prices of companies like Rheinmetall in Germany or Saab in Sweden, Thales in France. Um, there, are, there are many, many examples of that. And I guess what, what this all builds up to is, is the question that, that you pose yourself will this make Europe safer? You know, the, the, the argument that governments are making right now to, to justify these, these steps is, uh, is, is through the logic of deterrence. So peace through strength. And, you know, there, there, there is an argument to be made for that. You know, uh, the literature has shown that weakness can in fact um, sometimes invite conflict. Uh, however, Thomas, you, you, you pointed this out. If you aggregate the spending of all European member states, the EU is actually one of the world's largest military spenders. It, it, it fluctuates, um, but yeah, most recently it was the second largest spender. Um, so why do we still hear so much about, you know, broken equipment, lack of interoperability, the need for more spending, um, the fact that we don't yet deter uh, the threats that we face? And I guess the simple answer to that would be, it's, it's not just about how much money is being spent, it's also about how that is spent. Military spending itself is just an input Military capability is the output. Um, so, so there are, are many, many more factors to consider. And I, I, would, I would say that one of the biggest problems, um, and I guess one of my biggest personal criticisms of all of this is that spending is being tied uh, to economic output. It's really impossible to say, you know, once we hit the 2% target or once we hit 2.5 or once we hit 3% of GDP, then we will be safe. That's, you know, that's not how this works. 
Um, and, and on the flip side, you know, if anything, the past two years have shown that GDP can be very fickle and it can fluctuate. And that makes it difficult for defense ministries to plan long-term projects because they never know how much money they're going to get. Um, and that in turn can then cause delays and cost overruns and, you know, all, all of the things that we hear about in the news. Um, and, you know, I think at this point, I would much rather see a discussion about what are European military supposed to be able to do? What do they need to be able to do that? And how much does it cost to do that? That's really, you know, the, the traditional ends, ways, means analysis. And I think if, if we focus on that angle rather than tying uh, spending to, to economic output, we would have a much more nuanced debate and we would actually ensure that this additional money um, does what it's supposed to do and, and bolster uh, European security. And, and just um, one last thing to say, you know, regardless of how you twist and turn it, every single euro that is being spent on the military is a euro not being spent on education, exactly. healthcare, uh, climate action, you name it. Um, so, you know, it's really in the best interest of member states to make sure that these additional funds are being spent responsibly. Just throwing money at the problem without addressing the issues of efficiency and waste will not actually make us any safer. So, you know, it, it's... I, I don't have much to say in, uh, in, in, in this, but if, but if I could, I would urge member states to, to make use of instruments for European cooperation, like the European Defense Fund, for example, that can reduce costs by pooling resources and it also boosts interoperability, something that, we've, that we always hear about when we talk about European defense and security. Um, you know, minimizing waste, retaining a strong degree of, of, of parliamentary oversight, and spending funds efficiently must be at the core of this discussion. And, and I'm just seeing too little of that right now. Thank you, Andrea. Very clear statement. Thank you so much for your contribution. Um, is there um, a wish to comment? Yes, Andres, please. Just uh, again, very shortly, echoing some of the points that Alexandra uh, made. Uh, military spending reflects the situation. It reflects that we live in a different world. So when we see that number of countries have change their approaches, their attitudes, just uh, Sweden and Finland applied for the NATO membership. Denmark opted out from the, mm. opting out uh, the military cooperation in Europe, so is willing actually to cooperate in, in, in the framework of PESCO, permanently structured cooperation. Uh, but certainly, absolutely, I would agree that there are important questions added to military spending as well. One is, we should not forget it's not just about Europe, it's also about European countries being the members of NATO. And now after Sweden and Finland joining, this EU-NATO cooperation is extremely important. And also commitments within uh, NATO are important. And 2% is a commitment actually after Russia's aggression in 2014. So but this should be kept in mind. Second one, again, fully agree. It is also about efficient and responsible spending. It's not ju just about spending. And we see that there are challenges in this regard. Last but not least, it is not just about military. Once we come back to resilience, to consolidation of society, we come back to the issues of inequality, sustainability, the renewable energy, etc., etc. So certainly we should approach comprehensively. Military spending cannot be just singled out as a one issue, as a panacea to solve all issues in a global world. It's much wider spectrum of different kind of uh, priorities. Absolutely, yes. Uh, Hannah, please, and then Maria. Yes, I would like to put the issue of military spending, as Alexandra said, a bit in, in the bigger context, of maybe stemming a bit from the German example. We have thought the European Union as surrounded by friends for a long time, so our political perspective was focused on cooperation, and we thought if we would need military, then maybe for interventions on the African continent, on the Asian continent. But we kind of stopped having these territorial defense approach. And that is the major shift for Ukraine already before February 24, but I think for every EU member state now since February 24, that we will need militaries that can survive confrontation with Russia. So it's from cooperation view to a hard confrontation view. And that's when we started st taking stock in Germany. And just to give you one example, we have promised to NATO, which is in charge of territorial defense, 
um, that for certain capacities that we give to NATO as Germans where we committed, they need to have ammunition in stock for 30 days. So in case there is an attack, we can shoot back for 30 days. When Russia invaded, we took stock and we realized we have ammunition in stock for exactly three to four days, which is a bit scary. And then we started to count how much money do we need to just reach the 30 days that we had promised to NATO many, many, many years ago. That's 20 billion out of the 100 billion. And I can imagine many more member states making the same thing right now, which leads to the increased need of spending, which does not necessarily mean that we will have super whatever high-end warfare armies, but that we can just do what we are supposed to do to defend our territory. And now comes the European dimension. Alexandra briefly alluded to that, but this will be tricky. Imagine Germany having this increase in defense spending, Belgium having that, France having that, Poland having that, everyone having a certain increase. And how can you organize that in a way that it's not just the arms industry that benefits because we are in competition with each other. So if Germany wants five helicopters, Belgium two, Poland one, then the arms industry are going to say, well, you want your first five, you want the five ones to be first, Germany, then you just pay double. And that's what we have to organize right now. That's the first thing. The second aspect is the capacities. I guess it has been a realization for everyone that if Russia seriously attacks one EU member state, this is an attack to the European Union as a whole. And either we defend the European Union together, or we can stop this whole notion of the peace project and the European Union. Because if we let Poland, Finland, whoever would be attacked alone with this, that's the end of the European Union. So we need to see how, what do we have down the line to defend the European Union, not what does Germany have, what does France have, what does Poland have. And this assessment, we do not yet have made that properly. And the third one is procurement. At the moment, it's a bit like every politician trying to make sure that in his or her constituency, that one arms industry um, company gets, the, gets, gets like the contract. Even if we don't need ships, but there is like one is in the defense committee and, and they has a ship company at home, well then we buy ships. And that's really something we need to get over with to consolidate, which would take out a lot of the additional money that at the moment we put into the defense system that doesn't give us more capacities. And I don't know where we are. If you ask me, do you think we will make that? I think if we don't manage now, I don't know when. Mm. Maria. Well, as for human rights defender, I would have never imagined, even in my nightmare, to have to speak about uh, weapon <laughs> needs, <laughs> actually, I frankly saying, but it's all a consequential issue. And I think regarding uh, the spending on uh, weapon, they should be tailored uh, according to the needs. They should be proportional, needs-based uh, spending. Uh, and yeah, there should be a lot of coordination, I suppose. Regarding Ukraine, uh, the strategy of Russia is making Ukraine an unlivable place. Uh, it's not about targeting military infrastructure, it's about making Ukraine an unlivable place by targeting and destroying civilian infrastructure. So from a rational point of view, I think um, helping Ukraine uh, is actually cheaper than to later counter the problem of even bigger growth of amount of uh, displaced persons from Ukraine uh, and from response and then from, from recovering and helping Ukraine to recover with uh, Marshall-like plan. Uh, and we even didn't yet touch the topic uh, of threat of global food crisis. And uh, if it happens, it would be much more expensive for Europe to tackle this issue by not helping now. Thank you, Maria. Uh, indeed, uh, 
that's the things we need to talk about today, whether we like it or not. And that also counts for all of us. I told you it's not a comfortable topic, but we need to face reality, uh, whether we like it or not. Uh, thank you so much for your contributions up to now. And then last but not least, I, I will hand over the floor to Hannah back again. Uh, Hannah, you have the honor of synthesizing what that actually all means for green political decision, for green policies, for, for yes, our day-to-day -day responsibilities to decide, especially where we are in governments, in, in responsibility to take the decisions, and, and how, you, how you see our chances to stick to our common value frame and having this as a base for all the decision-making processes that may look different in different countries that have different geographical closeness to Russia, as an example, that have different historical experiences or also different political um, circumstances. So please take the floor. So I'll try to make the impossible possible, I guess. Um, you spoke about the green value base or the value base um, in your introduction to this panel and I found this a very good question because it's the values that should give us guidance especially when it's getting complex, especially when it's getting messy, not because we should fall prey to the idea that we can ever reach these visions but because they give us a guidance um, if we look at that. And I think the most obvious point is solidarity with the people in Ukraine and their struggle, and Maria has described it. Um, we have all heard, heard many, many accounts, and leaving them, their agency, that Russia is taking away from them and not becoming part of taking away that agency ourselves as well. That's maybe the first point. The second point is the very concrete political decisions that we need to make when we govern, and that's not easy. I guess all of us would like to dedicate more money and more headspace to things as renewable energy or feminist foreign policy than to deal with this war. But we have to deal with it. And for me, it's two things that guide me as a Green, and I guess guide most of us who are in decision-making powers in the member states. The first one is the strength of the law and to protect the strength of the law against aggression and against those who want to have the law of the strongest. Um, our Prime Minister of Montenegro spoke about the rule of law and how important it is for Montenegro. You mentioned the Second World War. There was one thing we did at the end of the Second World War that is to give us as an international community laws for how states deal with each other or don't deal with, with each other. How you respect the sovereignty, how you don't commit grave human rights violations, how you don't commit war crimes in the hope that something like the Second World War is not going to happen again. And the fact that we expect everyone else to follow the rules makes us follow the rules, but this only works if those who trample on these rules are being sanctioned, right? Otherwise, at one point, people will not obey with the rules anymore and we will go to, back to private militias. And that clearly means, and I mean, we try the non-confrontative approach with Putin, in my assessment, even far too long. We went to Syria first. People tend to forget that. He destabilizes large parts of Africa with Wagner. He went to Crimea. And every time we try to, to find still a solution without going for major sanctions. And then there was this brutal aggression. So I think if we really want to protect the peaceful world order and the idea of demilitarization because we have a peaceful world order, we can only do that if we sanction him now the way we sanction him in energy, but also with delivering weapons to Ukraine. And as weird as that sounds, I really think supporting Ukraine also with weapons, to defend themselves against Russia will lead to more peace and stability in the longer run. And just one very short example, because Alexandra mentioned demilitarization. Ukraine was the single country that has given up nuclear weapons in return for security guarantees. If we want everyone, any country ever 
to talk with us about non-proliferation and moving away from the nuclear, we cannot let Ukraine slip away right now. The other aspect of strength of the law is fighting impunity. Uh, Maria said a lot, and I think we Greens have pushed very, very strongly on member states level as well as on European Union to make sure that from the very first day we have a good documentation at least of potential war crimes so that already now it's happening inside Ukraine, but even in the longer terms um, we can investigate them and we can hold people accountable, which is very, very important. Um, there's a second aspect where we Greens have to play a key role. Everyone's focusing right now on military and on weapons delivery as a way to give security and a means to the Ukrainians. But security is much more, and that's something we have been saying since we have been founded as Greens. It's energy security. And all of a sudden this becomes mainstream, so there's also potential in that. Energy security meaning one, quickly move towards renewables because that creates less dependencies and it's better for the climate anyways. It's also decreasing dependencies from aggressors. Sadly, someone said it, it's usually the bad guys that have the fossils, but it's still easier to, be, to buy, the ba well, buy from 10 bad guys than to buy from only one, so that you are not as dependent as, for example, Germany is at the moment on Russia, to talk about food security. We will see quite a crisis towards the end of the year. But we also know that Greens in government are working on, together with G7 and others, um, on um, a better distribution of the food that is there, there on scaling up production. But there also, I, we have to see how we move that to a more sustainable path, because the Ukraine crisis is now for us very close. Other crises are very close for other places in the world. And we will always see these kind of dependencies, these kind of um, security problems um, elsewhere. So there, you know I'm an optimist by heart, otherwise I couldn't do this job of going to all these places. Um, especially when it comes to this complex understanding of security and fighting dependencies, especially on rogue states. There is also potential in this crisis that things that we have in our party platforms and that we have been fighting for for many decades are now better understood by others. And I just remember the discussion we had around North Stream 2 in Germany where the previous government was stubbornly until up to lying to its citizens defending this project which now has not seen a single bit of gas going to Germany and I hope it will never see that. Thank you, Hannah. As we have run out of time... Okay, Andres, I see your... your, your okay, Andres, please. <laughs> it's okay. We have this through two, three minutes we have. Uh, just to add a footnote to what already Hannah summarized, I think, excellently and extensively, I think we, of course, celebrate our commitment and what we've done and what we believe it's right and what we are doing. At the same time, still, I think there is things to deliver and to deliver in a short-term perspective and also in a long-term perspective. This could be the long-term fight as well. Yes, in the short term, we understand what should be done, but at the same time, these are long-term uh, sort of reformation, recalibration, our activities with regard, with visions to the neighborhood and also within ourselves. And I think they, to build a security, to build resilience, uh, it's about a hardware and a software. The hardware perhaps is the easy part. Mm. The hardware, it's the military and 2% of the spending or, or more even for some countries or energy as well, uh, sector development. At the same time, I think at the very end, it comes also down to the software, to the policies, at the very end, fighting for hearts and minds of the people. The being resilient within societies, being resilient within wider European Atlantic space, including all like-minded communities. So that's why I think there is a spectrum of shareholders in this uh, uh, important long-term uh, resilience building endeavor. And again, sort of I must say that I think Greens have become responsible uh, shareholders uh, 
contributing to the long-term perspective, and of course it should be continued with also such discuss discussions and such reflection on things what we can do. Thank you. Thank you, Andre, so for uh, adding this important point of democratic resilience also. We didn't touch on cyber security, we didn't yep. touch on disinformation, yep. we didn't touch on a lot of topics to go deeper that we should have gone deeper into, uh, using food as weapon, uh, using energy as weapon, uh, uh, att doing attacks through high energy prices and so on. It's a very big field that we should have talked about. But I want to thank you all for participating. Uh, I hope we, we were able to uh, give a, a certain f framework of the value base I think we all stand on, even though we might have different perspectives on the actual decisions we're taking in our roles, in our different roles, within different settings, governments, geographical uh, um, areas. Uh, in these really, really difficult times. And I think it's very clear that military weapon uh, deliveries and so on are not and cannot be a replacement for midterm and long-term peace policy, active peace policy. I have also learned today that it's not automatically in a contradiction, that one is not replacing the other, but that the political solutions, the negotiations, uh, the reconciliation, the 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 tackling of all the crimes that have happened, the justice needs to come in the moment the weapons end shooting, or even earlier. We, we, you're working on it, Maria. Many of you are working on it. Uh, and I know it's a very uncomfortable topic, and it's a very difficult topic and a difficult discussion. But I hope we were able to contribute uh, to broaden the insights on this situation that we have now. And I want to thank you all, Hannah, Andres, Maria, and our guest from CIPRI, Andrea, that you joined online to this conversation. And I want to thank all of you for listening to us and uh, being as, uh, well, steady to stay with us in this uncomfortable but very important conversation, which we cannot shy away from, unfortunately, even though we would like to. Thank you all. Thank you very much for your contributions. Thank you for the audience. As the thoughts um, we heard still linger, I also still wanted to extend my humble and respectful thanks for our uh, Ukrainian visitors who brought in voices uh, from the ground. And also say thanks to Thomas who masterfully navigated this complex discussion. If I may uh, afford also a personal remark, um, I think this was the first time that having studied and specialized in human rights and peace building and having worked for a few years on EU security and defense matters, this was the first time and setting when I actually didn't feel schizophrenic. <laughs> that actually these elements can, they need to and they must be reconciled uh, for lasting peace and resilience and justice uh, in Europe. And perhaps, just perhaps, this is the Baltic contribution to the green DNA in strengthening the compensatory parts of these two parts of the story. But now, so we have had rich food for thought this afternoon, and I have good news for you. It is now time for a short break. In just in two minutes' time, you can stretch your legs, exchange the afterthoughts, and also get the energy going for the second substantive part of our today's session. But before, I have the task um, and the intriguing offer to make to you to participate in the Green Family Raffle. So this is fun and lighthearted, but also meaningful. Um, so the, for, the, for the first time at the Council, in return for a donation that you can choose, you can win local and green uh, prizes uh, produced by Latvian socially responsible, socially engaged artists and organizations. There are 15 prizes overall. So, for example, um, you can win a 3D tactile eye mask made by Blind Art. And Blind Art is a social enterprise here in Latvia that provides work opportunities for uh, blind and visually impaired people. 
Another price, um, it's a super comfy and cool unisex hoodie with the print of Milda, the female statue that you can see in our uh, monument of freedom here in, uh, in Riga. And this pattern is made by Owa Fashion. And this company employs and upskills uh, women in uh, difficulty. And you can also win an eco-responsible cosmetics travel package from Madera. This is a world-renowned Latvian organic manufacturer with a very strong social responsibility policy, also uh, including support to women that have suffered uh, domestic uh, violence. Um, and for their goods, this company uses natural ingredients uh, which have been respectfully harvested uh, here in this wider region. So if you want to enter the raffle, uh, go check your email for a link to the raffle page or look for the stand that the raffle has outside uh, with QR codes that will lead you through the process. Um, and uh, this way you will be supporting uh, Latvian socially and eco-responsible companies, but also um, contributing uh, and also contributing to their cause. And very important, the raffle closes tomorrow noon. And the prizes uh, will be selected tomorrow at the end uh, of the plenary, uh, at the end of the dinner tomorrow night. And as you leave, those that have approached the door already, uh, please beware that outside you could, you will also be able to enjoy a musical performance. And this will be given by a Latvian uh, kukla player, Liga Gritja. And kukla is a sort of a type of a sitar. It's a Latvian traditional instrument. And uh, it has been living sort of a renaissance uh, these past few years. And my feminist heart uh, takes pride in the fact that it's mostly uh, imaginative and uh, skillful female uh, players uh, that uh, make the most of this instrument. And Liga, she's very well known also internationally, including having play, uh, been the first Kuokla player uh, at the Royal Albert Hall. And uh, this musical performance continues a tradition that uh, European Greens started during the pandemic. Uh, and the, the purpose is to support uh, cultural performers and the cultural, the creative sector uh, more broadly, as it was so uh, strongly affected by the pandemic restrictions. So please do enjoy and uh, come back uh, to be uh, with us. Um, now, the time that I have to have you back, is at uh, six o'clock uh, Latvian time uh, for our uh, second keynote speech, and it will be given by Dr. Anna Lorman, the German Minister of State for Europe and Climate. See you back soon and enjoy the break. Thank you.